Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, when I get home tonight and my wife and boys ask me what kind of Christians I was speaking to in Dallas, I'm going to say the kind that clap in church. <laughs> that's, that's all they're going to need to know. So uh, I'm so honored to be the Sheridan lecturer here today uh, and to be at Perkins Chapel and to be with a group of people who, whose faith inspires them to uphold the American values of religious freedom and, and religious pluralism. I want to begin with uh, a sacred text from Leonard Cohen. It's coming to America first, land of all the best and of the worst. It's here we've got the range and the machinery for change, and it's here we've got the spiritual thirst. It's from a song called Democracy. And as I walk through a couple of other sacred civic texts, where I want to take them is what's the spiritual thirst underlying some of the things that we consider core civic principles. I think that this is a, a distinguishing feature of the United States, which the great British writer G.K. Chesterton famously described as a nation with the soul of a church. Now the nation of a, with the soul of a church, a mosque, a synagogue, a temple, a gurdwara, a secular humanist society, a sangha, and on and on. But the big point here is that in so many of the things that we care about in our civil society and in our government structures, we're advanced by people of strong religious and spiritual conviction that benefited people outside of their own community, as I believe the BJC and so many of the Baptists and Methodists I know exemplify. Uh, this, that, that quote, that stanza from, from Leonard Cohen, uh, the, the underlying spiritual thirst of democracy in the USA exemplifies that to me. So on into a couple of our other sacred texts here. This is a familiar figure to, to many of you, and this is amongst his most uh, famous quotes. Uh, and you can, it's often understood as kind of an articulation of the civic when it comes to religious pluralism and religious freedom. So let's read this out loud. Actually, there we are. And I ask whether or no such as may hold forth other worships or religions, Jews, Turks, or anti-Christians, may not be quietable and peaceable, may not be peaceable and quiet subjects, loving and helpful neighbors, fair and just dealers, true and loyal to the civil government. It is clear they may from all reason and experience in many flourishing cities and kingdoms of the world. It's interesting when you uh, read uh, where the American founders got their notions about, the American European founders got their notions about religious freedom and religious diversity, you'll often read about the influence of John Locke's treatises on religious liberty, which were written uh, in the 1700-1701 range. Well, this from Roger Williams is at least 50 years earlier, right? So here is a second early text from European settlers in what became the United States about the importance of uh, religious freedom and religious pluralism on this patch of land. This is from the Flushing Remonstrance. I'm going to read two quotations. First, the law of love, peace, and liberty in the states extending to Jews, Turks, and Egyptians as they are considered sons of Adam. Next, a little bit later in the document, our desire is not to offend one of his little ones in whatsoever form, name, or title he appears in, whether Presbyterian, Independent, Baptist, or Quaker, but shall be glad to see anything of God in any of them, desiring to do unto all men as we desire all men should do unto us, which is the true law both of church and state, for our Savior say, say it, this is the law and the prophets." Again, a half century before John Locke, a century and a half before Franklin and Jefferson and Washington and James Madison and the others articulate in a more uh, uh, fulsome codified form uh, what we understand as the principles of religious freedom and separation of church and state in, on, on, this, uh, on this patch of land. What I want to point to here is the spiritual thirst, the religious conviction underlying both statements, which are often understood simply as an architecture for a type of government, right? It's right here in the Flesh and Remonstrance at the end, our Savior saith, this is the law and the prophets. This is not just about the best way to run a government. 
This is about a religious calling about what it means for this group of people to be Christian in the world. It is because we are a certain type of Christian, the drafters of the Farshing Mastran said, that we will stand up for the religious freedom and offer our protection to these Quakers who at the time Peter Stuyvesant, the governor general of what was then New Amsterdam, now New York, had banned. He had said Quakers were rabble-rousers and seducers of the people. By the way, has anybody been to a Quaker prayer meeting? <laughs> they, don't even, they don't even talk. Barely, right? So this group of almost entirely non-Quakers of my history, if I remember my history right, there's not a single Quaker at the time amongst them in a little hamlet outside of what becomes Manhattan called Flushing, Queens, now amongst the most religiously diverse uh, in the nation, probably in, in the whole world, stand up and say, this is not the way we're going to run our polity. They do it not just because it's good government, but because it is a Christian conviction. Roger Williams is not principally an architect of good government. He is a Puritan minister when he arrives in Massachusetts Bay in 1631. John Winthrop welcomes him as a godly man. He is given a pulpit in a Puritan church in Boston. It is his religious conviction that leads him to say, we should be the kind of city and state and polity that welcomes people from a range of religious backgrounds. Can't they live peaceably together? Can't they be loyal to one another and to the polity? What I wanna talk about in this chapel service is what is the content of this religious conviction? I'm not saying that it's not a powerful thing to say that as a participant or a citizen, and by the way, when I say citizen of the United States, I mean just people who participate in the public life of our nation. That's what I mean. Citizen of the United States, I stand for religious freedom and religious pluralism. That is powerful. But I think that there is equal and different power to say as a Christian, as a Muslim, as a Jew, as a Buddhist, it is a part of my religious conviction. It is a part of my spiritual thirst to stand for your freedom, your ability to thrive and flourish as your conscience calls you to do it in language that Baptists help to give us. What is the content of that? Well, I know the danger of exegeting uh, a Bible story as a Muslim in Dallas, <laughs> the Perkins Chapel. Uh, so if I get things wrong, you will help the preacher, right? We'll call on the congregation. But I want to spend a minute on the Good Samaritan story, okay? And the centrality of that and how it, in any, I think, kind of mainstream interpretation, is a religious call to partnership with those with whom we doctrinally disagree. A religious call to partnership with those with whom we doctrinally disagree. How does the story start? The lawyer says to Jesus, how do we attain eternal life? Oh, teacher, how do we attain eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the answer to that, right? Love God with all your might and love your neighbor as yourself. And then the lawyer says, and I have a wife who's a lawyer, I can see this happening, who is my neighbor? Let's go a couple clicks into the rabbit hole, oh teacher. And as people here know much better than me because you grew up with this, you know, uh, in Sunday school since you were three or four years old, uh, Jesus tells a story of a man who's beaten and robbed and left for dead at the side of the road that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he is passed up by two people, a priest and a Levite, leaders of his religious community. These are not random figures that Jesus chooses. These are specific figures, a priest and a Levite. Leave him for dead. They're following the law. Who stops? A Samaritan. What does the Samaritan do? Dresses the man's wounds with oil and wine, puts him on the back of his donkey, takes him to an inn, spends a couple of evenings with him, helping him uh, come back to health, gives the innkeeper a, a innkeeper a couple of days' wages and says, this man still needs some time to heal. Here's the money I'm going to give with you to keep him. If you need more, I will return. How does Jesus end the story? 
Go and do likewise. Every single person in here has heard this a thousand ways from Sunday, right? And when I used to teach in seminary in Chicago, they allow me to do strange things up in that city. I don't know, I've taught from, from Evanston to Hyde Park in seminaries there. Probably half of my seminary students would say that this was their fav favorite Bible story. And when I would ask them why, they would say because it is a call to love and heal and partner with the other in some ways to follow the superior ethics of the other. And that's kind of where I left it for, for so long. And then my friend Nick Price, who is a Missouri Synod uh, Lutheran pastor in the suburbs of Chicago, he sits down with me and he says, let's, let's actually look at what Jesus is saying here. And he flips first in his Bible, which he carries with him everywhere, flips first not to the Good Samaritan story, but to the story of the woman at the well. And we read the story together. Jesus meets a woman at the well. It's a Samaritan woman. And what do they do? Nick is reading lines with me. He's like, notice, Jesus is saying, you pray to the wrong God. You pray at the wrong temple. He's arguing doctrine with the Samaritan woman at the well. Who are Samaritans? They're not a random other. They are a religious other. They are people with a different doctrine. They are people who pray to the wrong temple. They are people who pray to a different God. Well, for me, that changes the texture and complexion of the Good Samaritan story. Who passes the man by the side of the road by? The people with the right religion. The people following the law of the right religion. Who stops? Who helps? The person who prays to God in the wrong way. How does the story end? Go and do likewise. How does the story begin? How do I attain eternal life? Y'all have a fancy word for this here, right? Isn't this something to do with eschatology? Something to do with, it's not just a story about being a nice person or a good citizen. It's a story about how you attain eternal life. What is the message of this story? But at least sometimes you partner with, you emulate, you follow the person whose doctrine you disagree with. That person in your midst has value. They ought to have freedom. They ought to thrive and flourish in the way that they view as right, even if you doctrinally disagree, because occasionally, at least, their ethics might be superior. You might learn something, something from them. You might have to follow them. You might have to go and do likewise. Your eternal life may depend on it. A Christian conviction for a civic architecture that puts religious freedom at the center and that allows religious diversity to flourish. There are Muslim examples of this as well. When the Prophet Muhammad, when the peace and blessings of God be upon him, first receives revelation in the year 610 in the cave in a mountain outside of Mecca where he was fasting and praying and giving alms to the poor during the month of Ramadan, when an angel squeezes him, the angel Gabriel, the same angel who comes to Mary, squeezes him and says, Ikra, three times, recite, and finally the first verses of the Quran, recite in, your, in, in the name of God who created you. And those emerge from the prophet's mouth. There are some stories that say the prophet wasn't sure what had happened to him. Thought perhaps he might have been possessed by a demon. These are some traditions in Islam. Not everyone, but some. And he goes back to the person he loves and respects and trusts the most in the world, his wife. In my mind, women in Islam follow the place of Khadija in the prophet's life, which is the person he loves and trusts and respects the most, the person that he goes to with the mystery that he cannot solve himself. 
And Kathija, his wife, says, I, I don't know what's happened to you, but I know that you are too righteous of a man for God to forfeit you to demons. We will go to a man who has greater wisdom on these matters than me. We will go to my family member, my uncle, Waraka. Waraka is learned in the scriptures. We will tell him the story and he will interpret it for us. He will tell us what happened. So Khadija brings her husband, Muhammad, who's known in Mecca as Alamin, the reliable, to her uncle, Waraka. They explain the story. Muhammad is wrapped in a robe. He's still shivering. He's sweating. He's still scared from what had happened. It's such a, such a crucible experience that had happened to him. They explain the story. Waraka looks in Muhammad's eyes, kisses him on the forehead and says, verily the prophet of your people has arrived. Who's Waraka? What does it mean to be learned in the scriptures in the western half of the Arabian Peninsula in the early part of the seventh century? Waraka is a Christian. He's a Christian monk. The first person to recognize the prophethood of Muhammad is a Christian monk. The sources suggest that Wadika never converts to Islam. The prophet actually never seeks his conversion. Wadika is content to have observed and allowed for a different religious civilization to emerge in his midst. I want to just underscore this for a moment. The first person to recognize the prophet, the prophethood of Muhammad, is a Christian who doesn't convert to Islam. As central as the Good Samaritan story is to Christianity, as central as the message that those with whom you doctrinally disagree ought to be allowed to live and flourish and thrive because you may learn something from them. You may follow them every once in a while. Your eternal life may depend on it. The recognition of the prophethood of Muhammad is as central a moment in Islam. Islam doesn't exist without it. And that it was a Christian at the heart of that, a Christian who the sources suggest does not convert, is not asked to convert in any kind of proactive way. That's an equal lesson for and about Islam. There is no compulsion in religion, the Quran says, but there are stories behind that. Part of the reason is because of the role that non-Muslims play in the life of the Prophet, from Waraka to the Prophet's pagan uncle, Abu Talib, who protects the Prophet with his life, never converts to Islam. Prophet Muhammad might not have made it out of Mecca had it not been for the protection of his pagan uncle, Abu Talib. What does this all say? that as centrally important as religious freedom is in a government structure, it ought to be protected by our Constitution. I'm very glad that it is. I'm so glad that there are organizations from the BJC to Americans United for the Separation of Church and State to all, a whole array of organizations who protect these. As important as these values are to a government structure and to how we think of a civic arrangement, I want to continue to highlight that there are religious convictions behind this. I believe in religious freedom and American pluralism, not just because I'm an American, but because I'm a Muslim. I believe that it is both a civic conviction and a sacred conviction. I want to end by quoting a little bit more of that sacred text that I begin with, Leonard Cohen's Democracy. I'm stubborn like those garbage bags that time cannot decay. I'm junk, but I'm still holding up this little wild bouquet. Democracy is coming to the USA. Thank you.